Welcome to an hour of Guitars, Life, and Mortality. I give you Greg Voros, who can tell his own story. I'm John Thomas. Um, John, our organizer, our host, put us together. And I think in short order, you will figure out why. So, Greg, tell us what your current job is, then we'll jump back to how you got there. Sure. And then we'll take a look to the future for both of us. I love it. So I'm uh, the oversight manager for George Groom uh, for Guitars in Nashville, Tennessee. I've been with George for a little over 18 years. I've done a lot of his uh, restoration work. I've managed a repair shop. I've done a bunch of things for George on the senior management level. Um, and that's been amazing. It opened many, many doors for me. Um, it was just uh, fantastic. Um, that is what I did for a very long time. Made some videos, instructional videos, so on and so forth, and everything was going great up until about two and a half years ago. Uh, two and a half years ago, uh, my father passed away right around COVID time, and uh, I discovered two weeks later that I had uh, I, that I diagnosed me with multiple sclerosis. Uh, I went through my my flare, which lasted about uh, four months, a good solid four months of being in bed. I wound up losing my right side. And almost immediately, uh, it retired from restoration. But my passion, I've written articles, this is, this is it, right? So that's what my future was going to be. I always looked to the great Stradivarius, being a builder into the 70s. I've always thought that I could take my restoration abilities into, um, at least into my 50s and 60s. Uh, being 40, 41 years old, it, it didn't go that way. So, Right after I came out of my flare, I, I wound up losing the majority of my right hand, which is still not uh, functional, and I didn't get it back. Um, so, uh, so that was that. It was kind of burying my father, being uh, diagnosed, and then burying my career. <laughs> well, with regards to the part that I really gave myself to, it's like a person doesn't give themselves to management. A person doesn't give themselves to being an oversight or repair shop manager. You have your craft. You know, this is what we do here. This is why everyone's here. It's to appreciate what we're able to do with, with, with our hands and our skills. Um, so we're going to start with the pity party, and then we'll go back. So you said three and a half years ago, right? Two. Two and a half years. So for me, it's three years ago. Three years ago, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Um, I had surgery July of 2020, and my prostate and it doesn't lip nose removed. A year later, my PSA prostate specific antigen, that's just a protein that the prostate builds. If you don't have a prostate, you shouldn't have any prostate specific antigen floating around your blood. It rose up and I underwent eight weeks of daily radiation. Um, that was uh, ended around December 2021. And as of January this year, I've discovered that my prostate cancer is still with me. That is, the surgery didn't remove it all, the radiation didn't sufficiently cook what was left, so now it has metastasized which means it is left where it originally began. Uh, no matter where the cells land, once a prostate cancer cell, always a prostate cancer cell. So if it lands in your bone or your brain or your kidneys or wherever it might go, it's still prostate cancer. So I've got that. It is incurable. It is probably treatable. It is treatable to some extent. Um, the, in this country, the default treatment right now is known as ADT, antigen deprivation therapy, otherwise known in the medical literature as chemical castration. So I get a drug called Lupron, which destroys my body's ability to produce testosterone. Cancer cells, prostate cancer cells, love testosterone. They can live without it, they just can't grow, but they can mutate. So it usually works for two or three years, and then life gets interesting. So John, our host, thought, put us together. We're going to, again, we're going to talk about guitars, life, and then we're going to go back to mortality where we're going after this. That's right. But this man's story is amazing. So when he said, yeah, I did some instructional videos. He did the instructional video, right? So I would like us to get where you, you are at the top of the heap, right? This is a man who knows more about guitars than probably anybody here, and everybody here knows a lot about guitars. This is a man who's had his hands inside the great D45, you know, half a million dollar guitars, right? And gone on tour, checking, been with the Stones, with other people, all kinds of, he's done everything. And he's, he and I are gonna lose a lot. He's already started losing one. So I would like everyone to know just how you got here. So you started in New York working and then get a knock on your door from George Groom. George Groom. So and runs the shop. 
So, yeah, so it was actually kind of crazy. I, I got started really young, and I was really fortunate that I did. Some people take time to find what they want to do in life. I, for me, it was at 18 years old, I wasn't very good at school. I wasn't, and then I knew I didn't want to go to college. And I was a guitar player, I played in some, actually some pretty noteworthy bands. It's, it's not really the point, but the point was I knew that my skill set with regards to playing the guitar wasn't there. I knew it, I was able to tell myself. So um, my, my proper backup to that is actual guitar repairs from a young age and paying your dues. I didn't assume that because I knew how to play a little bit, I knew how to repair either. But a year into me uh, apprenticing, I was actually, I got hired on as a paid apprentice. And by the time I was 20, I had a lot of customers myself. And I was, I actually made a pretty good living at 20 years old in New York repairing guitars. I did pretty all right. And what, what shop were you working with? Well, this was this was back when Guitar Center would farm out their, their repair work before they actually decided it was a good idea to, to hire repairmen. They actually farmed them out to legitimate outfits to do the servicing of their instruments. So I got, got, got with one of those guys and I was there for a couple of years. And I, and I learned, um, I, I learned, I got going. I mean, I had happy customers, but it, you know, I, I, I knew I was lacking in, in my abilities. Well, it was great. I could repair guitars all day long. And my other real passion was boxing. I, I, love, I love boxing and I loved it for a very long time. And um, I trained very hard and I had a great uh, trainer, coaching team, and I had everything going. I, I, I boxed out of the, the groom guitars. Uh, it's Gleason's Gym in Brooklyn is the groom guitars of vintage guitars. So I, I would bang around with, with, um, with the guys at Gleason's. I would, I would fight. I had a great trainer, Hector Roca, world famous Panamanian trainer. He trained um, Arturo Gotti. He had a lot of guys. I would actually work over his champions, his top 10 ranked guys, to get him ready for Madison Square Garden when they fought at ES on, you know, on ESPN. And um, something amazing happened to me during that time. Um, it was great. So going back to it, it was wonderful for me because um, there's an old Oscar De La Hoya um, trick to boxing, and that is you, you, you train when you fight. Meaning you don't train in the morning because all the fights are at night and it throws your headspace when you're banging at eight in the morning because every fight takes place at nine o'clock at night. And a lot of athletes don't or people don't realize what it does to you. That time difference of when you're used to training or whatnot. So it was great for me. I was able to repair guitars all day long. And then when I punched out at six o'clock, I would go home and have, have dinner with my girlfriend, my wife. And um, it's 20 some odd years ago. And, um, and then right after that, I would, I would take my car to Gleason's and I'd start at nine o'clock. And I would end around 10.30 after the gym closes. We had a good camp. And I did that for a long time. And I, and I had a good bit of amateur fights. I, you know, and I did pretty well. And I, and I really wanted to be a boxer. I made a great living repairing guitars, but I always wanted to be a boxer. So what changed all of that, it happened very quick. And it, it happened very quick. My, uh, my sparring partner, I was Dimitri Salida's sparring partner, was ranked top 10 Walter Wade, he fought Amir Khan. These are big people. And I, I worked him over, or tried to work him over around six, seven, eight, nine. So he had different fresh sparring partners for weeks on and weeks. And then finally, he fought at the Garden. I forgot who he fought. This is just before he fought Amir Khan, which was on pay per view. That was a big fight. And all my friends came over and we watched him on ESPN. It was great. Two weeks later, after we recovered uh, from any fight, we met at the gym, and right around that time, I purchased a newer Jeep Wrangler, and I was so super proud. I was 20 years old, great car, I got the place, and, and then right next to me, he parked in with his later model Jeep Liberty, and he told me, uh, I, I love the music, was super cool, man, and he was 26 and 0 at the time, and uh, I said to him, I said to him, 26 and 0, brother, we had a great time watching you, and he said, man, this was my biggest purse. And uh, he goes, man, it's my biggest purse, 26 and 0, I'm ranked, I'm doing it, man. I said, what'd you do, man? He goes, I bought most of that Liberty. So what that told me was that if you're 25 to 30 and 0 in boxing, and I know your name, and I want to be you, you're still making about 17 and a half to $25,000 to headline Madison Square Garden as a welterweight top 10 rank. So then I said to myself at 21, 22 years old, I was like, man, dude, I'm already killing it in my world. I, I, I haven't even got my first professional fight, let alone 26 of them. 
and I'm already old at 22 for any of us. And um, right then and there, I, it, it made it clear to me um, that it wasn't going to be a road to success. My biggest, my biggest focus, and this is the truth of it, my biggest focus was to get out of poverty. That's it. And my parents gave me an opportunity um, when I left. Uh, they left Hungary, lived in refugee camps, moved to New York. I didn't take full advantage of it. I didn't do well in school and so on and so forth. Uh, but then guitar repairs really, from a young age, it really took, and I, and I and I went at it as the only thing that I had. And how did you get the groove to get? Uh, anybody hear vintage guitar fans? Uh, I mean, George invented the vintage guitar phenomenon, really, yeah. right? And the, the pinnacle of that profession is working at George's shop and sure. becoming George's shop leader. Sure. And that's as high as you get. That's how right. did you get that job? Man, you know, when, when I got hired on by Walter Carter, Carter Vintage Guitars, you know, and um, Walter, I, I called him from New York, and I told him, hey, man, um, hey, man, I told him, hey, Walter, um, you know, obviously I knew who he was, and, and I was a student from an early age, so I, I read most of George's. This one, Walter was still at George Bruce's shop. Yeah. So he said, he said, hey, man, listen, we're always looking for great repair guys. When you move down here, come by, we'll give you a shot. And I said, oh, man, this is my end. This is my indie room guitars. And me and my wife, we packed up the Jeep. <laughs> and we were down here two and a half weeks later. That's it. We had nothing. I think we had like 1500 bucks, 2500 bucks. This was 17, 18 years ago. So how did Walter know you had the guitar repair chops to even give you a chance? He how, why did he give you a chance? He hired me on as the, the most entry-level setup guy. And uh, he hired me on as the greenest guy that Grooms has ever hired. Facts. And uh, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I was humbled. And I already had. See, that's the thing. That's one of the biggest. The, one of the biggest things that I did right in my life is when I got on with Grooms. I didn't look at the four years that I was making my customers happy. I was the green guy. I didn't care. I don't know anything. And and whatever you show me, I'm gonna soak it up. I already read everything that was written. And I just need to see. I need to see. Too. And um, I mean, you know, three years later, I made my instructional video with George. Which Tell everybody about the instructional video. The instructional video, it's a Legacy Learning Systems came to me and we did um, a, a guitar setup and maintenance video. And this is going back maybe 13, 14 years ago when physical copies actually, sale copies actually mattered. And um, it set some sort of uh, record. It sold just under 10,000 hard copies, you know, and at 50 bucks a piece, that's, that's a real deal. Um, so with that, I also made a lot of mistakes on the business side of all of this, <laughs> you know, because it, I didn't, I didn't get any richer from any of it. But fortunately for me, what it did was it was able to get my name out. And e even, even now, I, I'm like the only person, or maybe not around here, but I, I never had a social media account. As many YouTube videos that I've done for people, Gibson, I've done Fender, whatever, I've done everyone's videos. I remember. Uh, you know, whatever it might be, I was never compensated for any of the videos, ever, not once, but I didn't care. Because I was there to, to say, this is what I'm offering, this is what I got. I knew it was about the name. I learned that 20 plus years ago from John Malio. I'm, I'm a student of, of all of these guys I just supplied in the restoration world, not in the building world. And John, you started working repairs and restoration at Manuel Brothers, which right, Staten Island. But I, but I, I always, and I know it was so nice to meet John Malio this time around, as long as I've been around all these folks, I've never met him, and he, I always looked to him. Not, he was a builder, I didn't want to be him in that way. I knew I was restoration, but I always loved the respect that he received. And, and at the end of the day, he's a bad dude. And, and that's, he taught me that, that, that whatever, however you come across, you have to be polite, nice, or whatever it might be, but at the same time, you have to have the goods. If you don't have the goods, that, that's really it. It's the same thing with boxing. You want to be a world champion, you just got to win 36 in a row. And then every ma and, you, and then you're better than every single male at that weight in the world. 154 pound champion is at 154. You're the greatest stand-up fighter in the world. It's not the United States. It's the world. So I, I wanted something substantial in that way. So uh, I, I videos, so on and so forth. There's a natural progression, and I had a good mind for management and, and repair guys. I work really well with repair guys because I'm one of them, so it's easy. And um, so then I ran the repair shop until last year. I ran the repair shop for 12 years. So you did become the best in the world, right? Run, run, no, running Grooms Repair Shop 
in a vintage guitar restoration repair field is the job, right? It is the job. Yeah. It's the job. It's the job. So how many years from when you walked in to the computer's trial doing setups before to, to, run, to run in the shop? Five years. Five years. It's crazy. I know. It's insane, right? right? And I took the job, man, and, and, uh, and it was great. And um, it was awesome. You know, that, that was a heavy five years, man. Museum work, restorations, D45s. There's, you do, you do uh, herringbone and egg resets. You do, you do 40 of them. You've probably done more than most. Think right. about well, it. Most of the existing herringbones. Exactly. You know, we all know you everyone knows what herringbone is. Uh, D28, everybody knows. Yeah. And, 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 and so you do that for a long time, and then, and then you work with artists. So after I, I've done restoration for a long time, I actually. I was, I was great, I had all the demand, it's cool, but then I said to myself, man, restoration and museum work is great. But here's my beef with it, is that, is that it's great looking behind the case, man, it's so nice. But it's a guitar, it needs to drive like a Ferrari. It needs to be in the hands of a studio musician. So that's when I said, all right, well now, my focus is to work on the best musician's gear because I can make them happy. Give me the unhappy ones, I'll make them happy. And I know exactly what it is. So, I wound up taking all the national guys, all the national studio guys. I work for everyone, man. I, 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 it Tell us some of the names. Uh, name yeah. Tell us yeah. something. Do you want the names? Yeah. 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 A lot of folks, man. They're like, really, everyone. You know? Can you give us a couple names? Shit, man. I, I mean, you don't have to. I, I, I've had, I, you know, uh, there's a big question of what gauge strings Billy Gibbons plays. Everyone's like, oh, eights, eights, eights. Yeah. eights. No, it's not. He plays sevens. Uh, he plays sevens, man, to like 37 or something like that gauge. And I know that because he gave me a set when I set up his Constitution Les Paul. On a Les Paul custom with the Constitution, dude had me set it up with a set of sevens. And, uh, and then he killed it. And, then, and he's amazing, you know. But like, you know, guys like that, you know, dudes, you know. And, and um, I remember, uh, you know, I, I, I hate name dropping like that, but, uh, you know, the funniest joke that I heard in the music stores from Eric Clapton, every time he grabbed the guitar, and he played like four notes on it. He would, he would put the guitar back and shake his hand and say, "We gotta save some for tonight." Yeah. <laughs> like like, the dude, like he was gonna run out of riffs, right, you know. Right, but, right. but he was such a sweetheart, man, and he was such a good guy. And and, and to, to have the experience of having Eric Clapton next to you and close your eyes and look away and have him play just four notes and you know it's Clapton. Ah, oh, God, man, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, and and the reason I wanted you to drop some names because your rise was meteoric. Just yeah. incredible, yeah. and that you were doing that kind of work. You were, and still are, at the pinnacle of your craft. We're, we're yeah. about to go to the mortality version of this. Yeah, yeah. But um, before we do that, give us some, drop some guitar names. So you've had your hands in pre-war D forty five. So oh, half a million um, bucks these days. Oh, half a million bucks. I actually traveled with Thomas Tull and those Pittsburgh Steelers to overlook his like three and a half million dollar just first collection from nineteen fifty nine, and I, 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 you know. That, you get to meet a lot of folks and see a lot of things and have a lot of great opportunities. But again, all of that is great and it can end any day if you're not delivering with your hands. All of this is talk. All of this is, you know, this is what I've done that's great. But this is what proved it, right? And, 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 and that was always, I always say this to, to repair guys, especially at a higher level. I always say you're only good, as good as your last repair. So if you're getting your praises sung and everything is great, pay attention because you're only as good as your last one. You hand that off to Guthrie Trap or Bukovac or any of these guys, and then you're gone. Bro. That's how that works because you have to do that. But guys like Bukovac, you know, Tom Bukovac is a pretty famous guy in Nashville, a big YouTube channel, homeschool, and whatever. I've been doing exclusively Tom's work for 15 years. He's my best friend. He's, 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 he's just a tremendous player, and he's a great guy. And you know, it's it's those types that I want the best. I want the best. I've always looked at my uh, trade as more of a mechanic and a an historian in that way. Musicians are the artists. I'm not an artist. I'm a restoration guy. I don't take creativity. I'm holding my eyes on that. I know I'm an artist. Okay? Well, I think you could see me roll my eyes. Yeah, but, but, but work. for me, I have so much respect for musicians. The one thing I, I really go is the biggest compliment I can hear from a player is when they say, man, this thing's like so amazing. It's making me play things I never even thought I was going to play. In the hands of a professional musician, you're giving these guys gold and creativity and stuff. And that's what I really like. And plus, the, you know, I, I've always appreciated vintage guitars tremendously. And I've, I've always, people have asked me, Greg, why don't you build guitars? Every guitar you set build with something. Like, yeah, well, it's because I'm not an artist. I don't have an artistic eye to, to put together something that looks, in my opinion, 
like a like a like something that 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 is that is that is established, something that's there. So I just rather restore the ones where there's a finite amount of them, and that's the way I. Well, let's let's give a little bit of advice to the community before we go on to our yes, yes, yes. part. And it's this: What guitars would you recommend that the people exhibiting guitars out there? What vintage guitars would you recommend these people play? Now I'm going to get a little bit of Which background. Vintage guitars or what? any guitars? I get a little yeah. background. I gave a talk at the Berlin Guitar Festival a few years ago, pre-pandemic, so three or four years ago, and I got to give a talk to the luthiers the day before the show opened. There were about a hundred luthiers there. And I asked them, how many of you have played a Golden Era Martin? And not one of them had. Because there's no access. It's hard to get access. That's right. And so I started thinking, if you don't I have those you. benchmarks, how do you... I got you. Right? How do you design yeah. a guitar? So you pick, just name a few models of guitars that anybody who's building a guitar, if they're lucky, they should try to find access to. Uh, 1937 D28. It, 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 it amazes me how many people build Martin copies but never have actually studied the original examples. It's, it's amazing to me, and the ones that have usually get it right. And it's not, it, 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 because there's, there's little things that you should pay attention to, you know? Um, and the wild thing is, 1937 is the magic year in history, isn't it? Uh, 3728 is the whole year, you know? I would, I would want people to check out a properly made 45 from that period as well, just because the work is beautiful. Um, you know, uh, I, I also think that there's, um, there's beauty other instruments as well, especially for arch top guys, uh, the Angelico. I, I had the Angelicals part. I probably more made more of the Angelical pick cards than anybody. You know, uh, I had four of those pick cards for, for years. I had there was like three years where I don't think I did anything except make metal pick cards. It was crazy, and then I got tired of that. You know, I was like, I looked at all parts. The company all parts made up made up. I mean, an L five guard. Which looked okay. It, don't get me wrong. It was, it was like hundred bucks. Cost on it was like sixty bucks. I'm getting five hundred dollars for my beautiful finish, bound, miter, ah, this and that. A DA guard. I was getting like twelve hundred bucks for. But when all parts came out with it, for like a sixty dollar guard, and I looked at it, I'm like, you know what, bro? A hundred bucks ain't bad. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's it. I'm moving on. I'm doing something else. I, I, I did this. I did this pick guard thing. Uh, yeah, I'm moving on. Folks know that that. Particularly, some of the angelicals have celluloid that dissolves, right. deteriorates over time. So that's part of your job. Yeah, right. but I, I love that making the pick cards and stuff. But uh, yeah, uh, so some of the, the the Martins are important. Some of the arch tops are important for electric guitars. I mean, they're pretty straightforward. Um, except when you get to something like a laminated top press three thirty five, that's a little bit more complex of an instrument to build, especially if you're not a manufacturing company. Uh, that's something worth worth studying. Um, uh, Electric guitars, I mean, you know, they're, they're cool, they're great, I love them. All right, so let's move on, you know? Like, I love vintage guitars, I love electrics, and so on and so forth, but when we're talking about luthiers, when we're talking about fine handmade instruments, I don't want to hear instruments where the golden ones were made out of factories. Right? right. Now, I, I think the greatest electric guitar of all time is a Telecaster. It's two pieces of wood screwed together, That's and it. nothing else to That's it. it. And I don't know if you can make a better one. Right. Yeah. And I, I wrote an article on this. I don't even think that technically the Stratocaster is, is a guitar invention. It's actually an invention. It was the synchronized tremolo as a unit, a fulcrum point unit. That's the invention. The guitar is built around the synchronized tremolo. I don't even think that Leo Fender was looking to invent a guitar at that point. <laughs> and he was just rounding off the edges and sticking a tremolo on it. Yeah, but think about how complex it is. If you take a Stratocaster and you take synchronized tremolo away from it, it ceases to be an instrument. You can't say that about any other guitar. You can't put another one on there just to get it going. No, it has a, a it has such a, a, a pulley system to it that without that, it ceases to be one. It's kind of interesting. It's really interesting. It's, it's, I, I give so much respect for that invention, synchronized tremolo, and then later on, I wrote an article about Floyd Rose taking that design and adding a master's engineering degree to it and what he was able to do with it. Uh, but yeah. So, uh, so that's that. Yeah, we should, afterward, do an experiment. You brought that box of Floyd Roses. We're going to randomly attach them to some of the guitars. Yeah, randomly. Yeah, yeah, just randomly. Yeah. 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 But yeah, so, so the, 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 we can fast forward a little bit and, and get to some other things. Cause, you know, it's, we're at a point. Let's talk now about the start of the loss, right? Because yeah. it's, it's, even, it's a bigger game changer for you, I think. I can still, well, I'm older. I'm 68. Thanks. So, you know, I got some, I got some years left. You know, I'm, I'm not going to lose this much. Um, but life changed everything, and everything. I think probably as I could say, 
my sense of myself, I changed, my sense of myself changed. We talked about it this morning, and I thought to think of sort of my brain as the little Tetris game. You know, little obstacles are coming down, and they just suddenly rebuild. Once I find my cancer, boom. They, you know, they just move around. The DNA reattaches in a different way. I'm a different person. Different. And you, I think, could well, like that too. Yeah, you, 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 what it is is you, you mourn the loss of yourself. Yeah. Listen, the type of MS that I have, I don't, it's a man here. So the type of MS that I have, I was diagnosed in, in um, I was diagnosed in under three hours because I had an MRI. Most people that have MS, I did like Zoom uh, chats with MS folks, you know, solidarity type videos and stuff. I had my own peers. They didn't even believe me that I was diagnosed in three hours. And uh, they were like, oh, I took, they hunted for a year. They hunted for two years. And I'm like, yeah, listen, now, like, I don't want to be weird about this, but how many brain and spinal lesions do you have? I have seven. All right, well, mine were probably a little bit easier to see because I set the Vanderbilt record of 58. So just saying, like, maybe mine was a little bit easier to spot. But um, so they found out super early, well, no, they found out fast that I've had it for 20 years. And um, it took the passing of my father to make him go half purple before I went in there and um, they diagnosed me. Okay, so then four months of bedridden, four months of mourning your career, your your status as a husband, your future of a father and what you look like to your daughter and your kids, right? I mean, all of this, all this, and at 39 years old, at the top of my game, I'm, st I'm still in, at the moment that I was diagnosed, I was still in magazines. You know, it, it happens, you know, you get a magazine gig or whatever it might be. Whatever. But I was just, it happened to be banging and, and it was, I just happened to be there just to just to put it in my face while I was in bed, you know? And yeah, let's talk people just a little bit about muscular sclerosis, which is a nervous disorder. Lesions on nervous multiple, nerve tissue. All right, so multiple sclerosis is, 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 uh, is, is the myelin around the, is, is the housing around your nerves when that breaks down and deteriorates is when you start losing function, right? It's your own immune system that's beating it up and also causing these lesions. The flare-ups that you have with MS, right, they usually have to do with, um, with something that's shocking to the, to, the, to the body, you know, passing of a loved one and so on and so forth. And that could bring it out. But what happens is, is that when your brain head and your spine has these lesions, right? When your, your body tries to heal it up, that lesion becomes a scar. The scar is the sclerosis part of the MS. Multiple is just bunches of them, right? Multiple scarring of the brain lesions is really what it is. So for me, the reason I'm able to be mobile and walk around the way I am and speak and for the most part be in pretty good shape um, has to do with most of my lesions didn't scar over. We can chat about why that didn't happen and I'm not sure totally about that, but um, that's where I am. So right now I'm on some heavy duty medication at Vanderbilt and um, so as I'm, as I'm doing my thing, I got out of the flare, I went back to Groons, I told them I no longer want to work six days a week. I no longer want to work five days a week. Uh, I want to go down to a three day schedule and uh, you know, I, I want to continue to do my management work. So they were super cool. I, I love room guitars. Eric is a great friend of mine. George is such a great person to me. So yeah, they, you know, I, I, I actually got a promotion out of it a few months later. I became the oversight manager of, of the building company present. Yeah. Right, and you are not the oversight manager just of that vintage show. There's a whole new endeavor. About yeah, that. I oversee the, uh, the guitar factory in Lebanon, Tennessee, where we build uh, we build our own uh, our own instruments, our own group model instruments. They haven't been released. We'll release them in June. We'll talk about it some more. But I oversee that, and um, it's great. It's called, uh, George owned George Groon owns the design patents for what was the Tacoma Papoose the Thunder Chief. And um, when Fender purchased Tacoma some years back, it was one of the, the companies they let go. But George owned on the designs and he always wanted to put a guitar factory together um, to make his own designs and, uh, and I'm going to help him do it and we're going to do it and um, George is, is I, George has a lot of ideas and, and I try to organize them a little bit so we can make some sense of it. And so this guy, the street fighter, got off the streets and fighting and worked his way up to the pinnacle of career in probably a little record time. Really, yeah, it worked out. Yeah, it worked out, right. And 
Talk to us about what you've done since you came down with MS. Even more impressive what this man has accomplished since that time. No, it's crazy. It's well, unbelievable. So, unbelievable. So, so, so that's really why I'm here. Like a lot of the time that I spend now is doing little radio interviews and, and, and just interviews with my YouTube buddies that have channels and stuff like that. And um, so here's the deal. When I came back to work, the acoustic coffee company um, has been kind of courting me for like six months. They wanted to work with me. And I, I had lent my name to, to, to strings and endorsement. I had DR strings. I, I, I lent my name to I, Tyler Hunger and I own Professor Green's instrument products. So I, I'm no stranger to having th- you know my name on things or whatever it might be, but it was always guitar related. So when these guys are coming to me, I was like, dude, your coffee is great, but it's acoustic coffee. I get it, man. I was like, yeah, I'm a legitimate dude, man. Like, I don't know what to do with your coffee, you know? And then, <laughs> so then they said, Greg, listen, um, we went out to lunch, and I told them, I was like, this is where I'm at. You don't want to give me an endorsement. You don't want to give me any of this, bro. I'm not even, I retired. Like, I don't even have a hand. Who the hell am I to be telling people to get something? And he said, he said, he said, well, just, we'd love to work with you in Baroons and just keep in mind, we work with nonprofits. That was it. We work with nonprofits. I don't know anything about nonprofits. And I said, okay, this was six months ago, seven months ago. And I, I've got a relationship with them. Yeah, yeah. too. Yeah. 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 And I said, okay. So that night I went home and I thought about it. The following day I called up Rich and I told him, listen, bro, if we're going to do this, here, here's the way I want to do it. Let's do a blend. Let's make it my blend. I want it to be proprietary. I want it to be good. I don't even want to talk about coffee right now because I know it's going to be incredible. We'll name it after what it, we'll give it the name, and that's what we came up with the Greg Boros Legends, and um, and that's great. And they said uh, they said we could work something out where a dollar per bag goes to your nonprofit. Right? We work that out. Everything's cool. So now I have a blend. Well, I don't even have a blend. I have an agreement. I have my own coffee with my name on it. I said fantastic. Buck goes. I have a name. I know it will sell. Um, Fantastic, let's do it. So then, because I still was kept on a salary by, by some of my clients outside of the rooms, Jim Irsay, the owner of the, Pits, uh, the Indianapolis Colts, is one of the guys I, I work for. And, and Thomas Tall, I work with him. He's my only shareholder of Pittsburgh Steelers. I do a lot of his work as well. But this time around, it was Jim Irsay that, um, that said to me, uh, through the grapevine, he knew what I was doing with the coffee, and he said he wants to get on board. So one of his, his number one foreman told me, he said, man, Jim Irsay wants to give you $50,000 to start your initiative. I said, that's fantastic. So I went up to, to, to Mr. Irsay, and I said, Jim, I really appreciate what you're doing here. And Jim is really, I'm not sure if people know who Jim Irsay is, but he's a really outspoken dude. He's got, I kind of talk to you like, right? He's such a sweet guy. He said, Greg, $50,000, I'm going to give you a quarter million dollars. And um, and he did. So what I did with that quarter million dollars is I sent some of it to the Acoustic Coffee Company to buy seed money, to buy seed bags. So I purchased 4,000 bags of my own blend to give out to people, right? And then I took 200 some odd thousand dollars and Vanderbilt gave me my own nonprofit. And so instead of partnering with the MS Society or something existing, Vanderbilt gave me the Foros Innovation and Impact Fund. And it's a fund where all of my efforts go into, and quarterly we have meetings um, at Vanderbilt on how to disperse the money. And so that's really what I want to talk to people about, and that's really my focus moving forward. I, this will always be a passion of mine. I will always work at Green Guitars. I will always help in whatever that needs to be done on whatever level. But this is so important to me, and because I see what's happening. So in seven months, from an idea to all of this stuff, we have coffee, things are going great. The first uh, meeting that we had uh, with the Vanderbilt folks was incredible. I allocated all of it, 220 grand I had in my account. I just spent all of it three weeks ago. And I tell folks what I'm doing with the money so that it's in full transparency and they see exactly what's happening. So 170, almost $180,000 was allocated to start uh, the Vanderbilt BioLab MS database. And that's taking uh, 26 years of 
MS MRIs that Vanderbilt has possession of. I took $175,000 and hired two full-time database guys um, to, to, to make a database from it. And from the conservative numbers that myself and super smart neurologists and folks are telling me, is that in the next two years, this will yield us 20 new facts never known with regards to MS. It's a it's a hundred seventy five grand for that. Nothing. And, and, and considering I know people buy guitars for five times that right. without thinking. Right. <laughs> but so one hundred seventy five went for that. Thirty solid thousand dollars went for uh, educating uh, rural Tennesseans about this ailment of MS. And we'll get folks from Social Security office and lawyers to come down and how to apply for disability benefits and so on and so forth. So this is this is honestly becoming my life's work. Not so much the coffee. And I love the coffee. Acoustic Coffee Company, these guys are incredible. I love them. Online, uh, acoustic.coffee. I love them. They're fantastic. But they know where I'm at. They know what, what, what my focus is. My focus is to take care of the folks that have MS that can't take care of themselves. So all the months are going by. I get my infusions once a month, and my nonprofit is, 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 is actually buying tremendous worthy things for the hospital. From from the, the first vertical wheelchair that was purchased at Vanderbilt was purchased from my nonprofit. It's amazing. You know, um, I'm I'm talking boosters. I'm talking additional lab work that that we think that it's certain people with certain MRIs or certain <clears throat> blood work that need extra work. We step in. My nonprofit steps in. My my neurologist. She knows. She knows. Make it happen. You know. You know. Yeah. What am I going to tell you? How can I tell you how to best spend? You, you, you've been in this game for, for 30 years as a professional, you know? So she's a great partner and, and I love working with her, but we are making moves. So that's what I tell folks, like, I have many people behind the scenes, not many people, some folks behind the scenes that have unbelievable sums of money. And those guys are so incredible and, and they take care of some of those moving parts, especially to start this up in the long-term part. But, you know, the, the coffee sales are important you know, and, and those dollars add up. So when I do these events, I tell folks exactly what I'm doing with the money at that time to try to get folks to get in. And plus it's good coffee too. Yeah, it's, good coffee. it's good coffee. And I, and then I went into that whole thing where I wasn't going to put my name on something that wasn't right. So um, check it out. There's a, there's a QR code on the, on the poster outside with my face on it right by uh, American Art Soccer Tours. QR code. And um, if you guys, like coffee, whatever it might be, order bag, it really goes to a good cause. I get the metrics behind the scenes from both Vanderbilt and the coffee company. So I see every single dollar that comes in. My, And I told you this, and I'm really hard on this, and I know this is on video, but I, I make mention of this every time. Every single time, because it's very important. I will never make a penny on any of this. On any of this. Neither will groom guitars. This is not, this is not a, it's nothing like that. We will never make a penny on any of this. And um, Groom Guitars is kind enough to actually employ me so that I can do this because they know they know that it's important to me. And I've already, you know, I've done a lot for George and, and they've done a lot for me, so we're kind of family in that way. But um, this is this is very important work and, and I look to move forward with it and I and I want to establish hopefully a name for myself in this world as well before I, before I, before it's all I have a couple of things to interject. First, buy his coffee, but buy two bags of coffee. If you also put JT versus cancer in your code, a dollar goes to the prostate cancer for me. There you go. Uh, and we talked about this that at this stage in life, I say we're, we, we're close to that precipice of mortality. Right? Those are close. And I think a lot about legacy these days. So I have, I have a prostate cancer recovery diary on YouTube. I documented my journey. The night before, I got my prostate removed. The night before, I played a song on a guitar. Took the guitar to the hospital. As soon as they came out of anesthesia, a little, little uh, floppy there. I played the same song. So people could vote whether I sounded better with or without cancer. It turns, it, it turns out, it turns out it was a fraud. My surgeon missed some of my cancer, so it wasn't, you know. Uh, but that's a whole other story. Uh, but I have two people credit me with saving their lives who followed me in the guitar world and went over and watched, started following my cancer diary and got a PSA test and discovered they had early prostate cancer. And one of these gentlemen is gonna fly. And there are other groups who, there are a total of eight guys who credit me with something. One of the fellows is not quite as rich as your rich friends. Would you give them my name, by the way? 
You tell them I like football, I don't really. It's a lie. You lie from your head. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to fly us to Chicago for a gathering about that. Um, but I, I think, I think it's, it's a different place in the world to know that you have uh, an interesting future, to put it nicely. Oh, dude, everything, it's just yeah. wild, right? Everything, everything changes, man. Yeah. So I am laser focused on this mission. And, and here's the thing, too. Like, the legacy part, leaving things behind, whatever right. we talked about this this morning as well. You know, it's uh, I think it, what everyone wants at the end of the day is, 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 is for your loved ones to be proud. Right? It's one of those things where you actually mattered. Right? Did you do something? And, and what did you do? And, and were you able to help people? It's a phenomenal guitar collection that you have there. Were you able to help people in the process? And sometimes you can't because sometimes you're supporting people, so you are. You know, whatever it might be. But I always say, like, um, I always say, man, it takes little little things, you know. And one of the biggest, uh, and I told you this before too, the biggest nightmare to me is when it was I was flaring right in the middle, of it. nightmare scenario. And uh, and I remember I, I had a nice house, my wife, my daughter, got it going on, everything was cool. I never had to worry about my mortgage, or at least no more than like maybe six, seven months. I would have worried a little bit, but in the beginning, I never worried about money. So I said to myself, man, I think that if I worried about my mortgage payment next month, I would never get out of my flare. Right. Because it's all having to do with, with, with inflammation and stress and all of those things. And then I kind of realized why some folks aren't able to get out of it. And I get it. And, there's, and, and, and then we go into human dignity and, and so on and so forth. And, 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 and that's that. And that's where I kind of, it's out of fear. Well, it's out of fear. So I, 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 I'm doing things out of fear. Well, I, no. I, don't, I don't believe you. I don't believe you have any fear. I'm not falling for it. But I think about leaving a positive footprint. That's my bet when I leave, right? And I do talk, think about this privilege of being able, being financially secure, and, also, right. and being able to dedicate a good portion of my energy it's to something good. Yeah. Right? But and not everybody gets to do that. No. But, 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 but again, I, I always go to say this. Like, let's get real here, man. Like I, I work for folks that are literally billionaires or, or hundred over millionaires and so on and so forth. And these beautiful people, you know what I mean? Uh, and my, my motto is I'm like I think I'm like one of the first middle class philanthropists where I'm looking to put the next 15, 20 years of my life into actually not my 401k. I'm fine. It's it's one of those things. Like I have enough. I'm good. It's no longer my focus. I, I'm fine. I'm sure I'll be fine. But the, 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 the scariest part to me, and, uh, and, 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 and what I don't think anybody should go through is just that, to not have nursing care, right. you're alone. I'm fortunate I have my wife. I have family in that way that can help and take care of me. If I didn't, I could have means to take care of that. But the idea that I would have to wait for a nurse for a day or two before I can get changed, right? right? That disrespect is, is, to, is to be had by no one. This is not this like is, a dignity. It's, right? it's, yeah, it's we true. Don't, dignity. We don't have to worry about it. We're lucky enough not to have to worry about that. That's it, brother. So look at look, look at the look at the work that we're doing. Or look at the work that I'm trying to where my focus is 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 that Jesus, it's not even that big of a deal. I'm I'm looking to keep some humanity for folks. Right. And if it can be done through coffee, yeah, put my name on it. Yeah, well, let's do it. Yeah, it's one of those things for me. So yeah. Um, it also has made me a much more grateful person. I, I think oh, it always yeah. was a decent little thing. Did you ever did you ever like Really appreciate a breeze, not like this. I know, man. Ever appreciate standing over there playing a guitar? I get it, though. And, right. and I mean, just being in that room, it, right? So it's it's every moment, right? I get it. Yeah, I don't I know it. how many moments I've got left. That's it, man. And uh, so our illnesses are very different. We, I mean, I face it later in life, so I'm lucky in that. Um, I think my end will be easier than yeah. yours, right? That's a thing to think about, right? That's yeah, a thing a, to think about. You right? gotta have you gotta have like a dark sense of humor. You do, right? Right, right, or develop one right. quickly. <laughs> You're in trouble if you don't. Right? Right. Yeah, and, uh, and and I think having people around you. I, I think you know what helped me tremendously is is the outpouring of support. Yeah, I didn't realize I had so many friends, and uh, and 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 because we're all cool and so on and so forth. But the, the, the people call; they're so generous, and I never taken anything from anyone. I still won't. Right. But the, the the idea that they would say, "Hey, Greg, I'm here to help out with medical bills. We're here. We can, let's do a, let's do this. Let's get a benefit. Let's do that." I don't want any of it, but, but 
the idea that people are thinking about. Yeah, it's, How it's cool is that? That's great. Oh, that's a great thing. It's, it's, something yeah. happened right over the last 20 years in Nashville for me. So uh, I'm oh. really fortunate. And, um, and I'm trying to really move forward. At some point, I'll, I don't think I'll ever get out of guitars in any way because it's just, I can curate, I can do a number of things. And I just, that's something that's a, such a big passion of mine. But at the end of the day, um, this nonprofit work and actually making moves behind the scenes where I can actually watch a person get transported in front of me. And, and I look at it, it's like, how, how much work did it take for me to do that? It took a lot of work. It took maybe 20 some odd years at the end of yeah, it. But I say it took a lot of work. I mean, it doesn't seem like it at this moment. Yeah. You had to be where you were. To have I get it. But, but, I, but I love it. And, and that feels good to me. It's a bunch of feel goods and, and, I, and I enjoy traveling and meeting folks. And plus every time I, I travel and I, and I look at insurance, um, you know, I'm so impressed. It, 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 everything has improved so much in the world of builders and even insurance repairs. So and we had this this chat, you know, 20 years ago, guitar shows were much different, you know, and um, it was really kind of a mixed bag of arts and crafters and, and, and legitimate luthiers. So you had John Monteleone and some dude, you know, on the second guitar, trying to figure out how to mix up some loot, you right. know. Things are different now, you know. Things are different now, and, and I looked around. I think I saw everyone's builds. I really went around, um, and you know, and I was so impressed. There was a lot of solid builds, and people are passionate. You can tell on people's faces how much work they put into it. You know, this is this is really maddening work. You know, it's really, it's not for everyone. Building guitars and instrument repairs, it's not for everyone. Not everyone's cut out for. It. And, um, and it, it ages you. I, I turned 77. No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> I had a bunch of young men. A bunch of young men. <laughs> yeah. I think by the time I turned 40, yeah. 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 But, uh, but yeah, I, 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 this, this show's been fantastic. And, and, I, and honestly, I, I just want to really thank people for coming and listening to, to the story, our story. Do you know, have questions? Comments? Criticisms? <laughs> You mentioned that you were lucky in that your lesions didn't scar over. Does that mean they healed without scarring, or are they still No, alive? they're always they're always lesions. Um, you know, inflammation is a big deal for folks with MS. So you have to maintain a calm, cool, collected spirit, not to get worked up. Stress is a killer. You know, certain foods should be avoided. Um, you know, uh, but no, there's no healing. There's no healing. The, the hope is that the medication that I'm infused with every month will, will prevent my immune system from continuing to create these lesions. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, I've been on this medication for two years. Um, I own a cane. It's really sporadic for me. So, like, I actually worried a little bit because I didn't bring a cane with me to this trip, you know. But I figured out with Tyler, he, he takes nature walks all the time. I'm sure he's got some Gandalf stick for me if I didn't work out. But. I've actually never flown with a cane before either, so I was nervous that they were going to give me a hard time. Um, it's it's hit or miss. I can have some days where I, I look like a like like I feel pretty great. So when I walk around right now, I feel dynamite. And it's funny when John was asking me what kind of accommodations would you need, and I'm like, dude, that, that show's like three months, bro. Right now I feel great. Next week's another thing, man. I don't know, but right now I don't need a wheelchair. I don't need maybe a walker, not a walker, a, a cane once in a while. But I'll take care of that myself. Um, for me, I'm doing pretty simple. You are. People should know that MS is a, is a roller coaster oh. journey. I have two other friends with MS. Although there's MS and there's MS, you're just much more aggressive than my other two friends. It, you know, it, it, it tends to be harder on males than females. Um, you know, fewer males get it than females, but when males get it, it tends to be a little bit more harsh. You know? um, but I will say this, and, and you know, even though I have what I have and so on and so forth, um, I, I still got it great. I mean, I'm mobile, I'm walking around, jumping around, everything's great. I have, I have, you know, the wonderful folks at Vanderbilt. I'm okay. I don't know who's got it worse. It's never a contest. It's never one of those things that I wouldn't want to be. Right. You, you know, it's not like that. But, but you know, it does suck. But you get over it. You eat it. It's one of those things. One of my friends told me, is, you know, he's like, you got to eat the crow. You know, beak and feather and everything. Just eat it. But once you eat it, You've processed it, and now what are we doing? Well, I still have a family. I still have a daughter. I still have a career. I still have a name. I still have 
I still have to make money. I still have to maintain life. I can't. There's you gotta move, man. You gotta move on. You gotta work to do. You know? yeah. I mean, we gotta keep busy. Never forward. Never forward. <laughs> yeah. Godspeed, bro. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you.